Welcome to TFL Let's Talk, and I am your host, Sapna Bhartia. Cortex is one of the leading reliability S code platform, which is designed to give engineers and SREs comprehensive microservices visibility and control. It kind of provides a single pane of glass for visualization of service ownership, documentation, and performance history, replacing tribal knowledge and spreadsheets. But what is this tribal knowledge uh, and how to replace it? To learn more about Cortex and how to replace uh, tribal knowledge with comprehensive visibility and control over your microservices, we have two guests from Cortex, Nikhil Unni, co-founder and chief architect, and Ganesh Datta, co-founder and CTO. Ganesh, Nikhil, it's great to have you both on the show. Thanks for having us. Great to, great to be here. Perfect. Uh, let's start with some basics. Uh, tell me a bit about the company itself. I gave a brief overview. Just tell me if I'm right or wrong. I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, so uh, the company itself, we've been working on Cortex for about a year and a half. Uh, we were in Y Combinator and you know, Sequoia let our seat about a year ago. Uh, we're very much focused on you know, how to help organizations build a culture of reliability, service quality. And a lot of this comes down to the sprawl of microservices that a lot of, a lot of organizations have today. And so as organizations grow, you end up building a lot of microservices. You start to lose track of the quality of those microservices, what you're building, this understanding a lay of the land. And so I think Cortex really comes in to say, hey, let's get a baseline understanding of where our services are at. What is our service maturity? What is the service quality? What are we building? What is out there? And I think the Cortex is, is the first platform that can let you do all that in a single place. Excellent. Uh, you talked about, you mentioned culture. And when we look at any technology, there are two aspects. One is tech part and one is culture or social part. So from your perspective, it seems that uh, not just your perspective in general, <laughs> no matter where we look at culture becomes a bigger problem. So how much you see the cur culture plays a role when we do talk about whether you talk about site reliability or, you know, we also talk about chaos engineering, no matter where we talk about culture is the core. So how much problem do you see is there with culture? I would say that's the primary problem that we're trying to solve. Like over the last five or six years with the proliferation of microservices, you see teams kind of independently building out their, their services, but then the sort of side effect of that is what happens after that? Like after many years of building new services and they're all low quality, how do you sort of like get a rein in on that and like say, this is what, a standard microservice should like, like, look like within our organization, and how do you actually track that over time? Yeah, I think that the cultural aspect is something that a lot of organizations don't think about when it comes to engineering challenges as a whole. I think there are a lot of tools out there that are very much focused on the technical aspects of microservices. You know, you have your observability, monitoring, pub sub, uh, you know, all the things to help you actually run and deploy microservices. But one of the things that happens when you have a microservice organization is, you know, how do you understand the quality of the services, and then you, you even get like this like sub org type complications and cultural challenges. So for example, you know you have an SRE team whose main charter is to help the organization build reliable software. You have an, a security team whose main charter is to build, make sure that teams are building you know, with security in mind. And then you have the actual development team whose main charter is to actually build the features that you know, the business cares about. And so each of these different organizations has their own charters and these are kind of competing priorities in some sense. And so one of the challenges becomes as an SRE, how do I get engineers to care about service quality and do the things that you know, we want them to be doing? You know, how do, as an S security uh, team, how do, how do we get people to focus on those things? And so one of the things we think about a lot at Cortex is how do we bridge the gap between these organizations and help SREs work better with developers? How do we help developers get visibility into what SRE cares about outside of just spreadsheets that an EM somewhere has put together and is you know, circulating within the team. When we talk about microservices, there are two kinds. First of all, it's Greenfield, and second is a lot of you know, lift and shift is happening. Also last year, because of pandemic, a lot of companies, they rush towards cloud, they rush toward digital transformation because that's what needed for the survival. So they rushed into a lot of things where they had no strategic planning. And now things are settling down. They are waking up from their hangover. So what have you seen from the customers that, what are the you know, challenges or problems that they are facing because of that rush, which can also be a microchasm of the industry in general? Yeah, I think a common trend is like, you kind of hit the nail there again, is like modernization. You know, a lot of organizations have been building software for a long time now, you know, and you know, JVMs that are 20, 30 years old, you know, things that are, have not seen the light of day. And now organizations are coming to terms with like, hey, if, if we want to be in the, in the 21st century and really you know, to help, help our business take off, we need to modernize our tech stack. And so a lot of enterprise organizations are thinking about this. And their first question is, where are we? Like if, if there is some you know, green land in the future that we want to get to, you know, that is the, 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 the main target. 
where are we today and how do we get there? And so even just getting a baseline understanding is super important. Like where are we at? Where are our services at? Which ones require investment? Which teams require investment? Which teams are doing well? And then drawing that baseline and then using that to set a plan to say, these are the areas of focus for us. So for example, even a lot of organizations struggle with unit testing, test coverage, because that was not maybe a practice that they were following. They were not doing this as part of CI. So even sending something as basic as, are you running automated testing? Do you have a CI pipeline? Are you actually, are you actually building every time you commit code? Um, getting that basic understanding, I think, is, is the first step. Um, so I think a lot of organizations are trying to get a grapple on, on just that and then kind of seeing where they can take that from there. And certainly with the pandemic and the distributed workforce, like a lot of those problems have like kind of risen to the forefront, like any sort of communication problems or broken processes within the organization. Like microservices have introduced this problem and now the COVID has kind of accentuated it. So it's been kind of a gift and a curse for, for us uh, at Cortex. If you look at cloud native in general, it's uh, if you look at CNCF landscape, there are so many logos, uh, which is a beauty also. But at the same time, it becomes over overwhelming for customers uh, and users. Uh, and if, if you just look at microservices from that perspective, you know, uh, uh, the nirvana would be that hey, it should be easy, but it is not. So uh, can you also talk about the kind of complexity challenges? of just microservice management. And then we can also talk about how Cortex enters the picture there. Yeah, sure. I think microservices, like, like I said, gives you a lot of challenges from, from a technical standpoint, or organizational standpoint. I think the technical stuff, you know, a lot of organizations are solving that today with automation around, you know, setting up your observability stack automatically when you spin up a new service, you know, creating scaffolding for new microservices. So it makes it one click to spin up a new service. Um, and I, I think part of it also just comes to being thoughtful about, hey, do I need to build a new microservice for this? Does it already exist within the organization? So creating visibility into what's already been built. I think a lot of it comes down to that. And then also secondarily, making it clear what the standards are. So at, within our organization, I think one of the things that is tribal knowledge is not just tribal knowledge about what a service does, but tribal knowledge about what service quality means. Like we kind of have an innate understanding of, hey, if you're using this microservice, that's okay because it's reliable. You know, we, we know the uptime, et cetera. But that kind of understanding of like, this is a good service, that's tribal knowledge. So making it easy for developers to understand as an organization, these are the things we care about. These are the ways we have defined as the right way to build microservices. I think making that very explicit and codified is super critical to doing microservices the right way. Yeah, I would say like, Part of the philosophy of microservices is cultural rather than technical. Like teams should be independent to build what they want. Uh, it's very much like uh, if you go out of the scope of the SRE org or engineering in general, then you're kind of on your own. And so that's a big part of the problem that we're trying to solve. Like how can we kind of rein it back in, introduce best practices, while also giving teams independence to build whatever they want. We have used the term tribal knowledge a lot. Um, you alluded to that earlier, Ganesh, but I want to just go a bit deeper into how would you define uh, tribal knowledge and what's wrong with it? Yeah, I think tribal knowledge is something that developers are like innately familiar with. And we talk about it a lot and you know, we talk about solving it, but I don't think it's really a good way of doing that. When I think about tribal knowledge, I think about those things where it's kind of like a hush hush, like, you know, the things that we know and we talk about, and it's kind of like, the, it's like the inside jokes of knowledge, you know, it's like things that me and you understand, because we've been working on it for so long, you know, we're exposed to it, but you talk to somebody else and they're like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, what does that mean? That to me is tribal knowledge when, you know, if me and Nikhil are having a conversation about our tech stack, you know, something that we built about a year ago, and then, you know, our, the engineers on our team today are like, like, hey, can you, can you dig into that a bit further? Like that, that's, that there is tribal knowledge. And that, that kind of comes across many different things. I think processes, like what are the processes that we use when we deploy a microservice? You know, that, if that's not codified somewhere, that could be tribal knowledge. Like, hey, like you, sh you should have checked this particular dashboard, but you didn't. And that's why we have this outage. You know, processes like that can lead to incidents. That's, that's an example. Another thing is just what microservices exist. What have we built already? Like, should I be rebuilding this? Is it already out there? That's another example of tribal knowledge, even things like best practices. Like before I go into production, I need to have my dashboards, my run books, my on-call rotations. In a lot of cases, you know, either that's like some checklist somewhere and the existence of that checklist is something that only we know because I've been working here for a while and DS already pinged me about it um, or even the quality of services. So I think that the challenge with tribal knowledge is A, it's like an organizational risk because as an organization, if that person leaves, then we've lost this kind of that that the knowledge that we've accumulated over time. And B, it just makes developers more inefficient because it takes me longer to come up to speed 
And there's no way for me, for me to easily understand these things without just being a part of the organization for a long time. Tribal knowledge is just something that every engineer is sort of intimately aware of. Like if you stay on a team long enough, like there is information loss, like there's a lot of inefficiencies when engineers leave the team, new engineers join the team. Um, and so that, that's like a big uh, thing that we're trying to solve. I think Nikhil, uh, one of the things that, uh, that Nikhil always talks about that I like is the, like Conway's law. And I think that really plays into that tribal knowledge. Uh, yeah, maybe you want to just kind of describe that and you know how it might play in. Yeah. Uh, so Conway's law roughly for, for software is that the systems that you build end up sort of mirroring the organizational structure of the teams that built them. So like that that's kind of a big part of the microservice proliferation. Like teams want to independently build their own systems and not have like interdependencies in between systems. Um, but then of course, like when when teams leave and or, or the reorg or, or people leave, like all those systems break down, all the knowledge that like sort of like intimately uh, was sort of gathered to, to keep that system running is lost completely. Um, and so we would like to systemize that, like make it as apparent to maybe an engineer on the other side of the world, like what is really going on within my team. Um, so it's not just so insulated. We mostly talked about the problems. We did touch upon solution a bit, but if I ask you, you know, from uh, the company's perspective, and we have not talked about that a bit, uh, which is if you can tell a bit about, you know, uh, how are you helping the ecosystem, developers, SREs, uh, if you can talk about what kind of solutions or services you have for them. And uh, if, uh, of course, as I said, you know, there is no nirvana, but if there was a nirvana, what would it look like? Yeah, definitely. I, I think it comes back to all, all these problems we're talking about. A, it was like the, the automation and like, understand, like tribal knowledge. The second piece is around you know, best practices and making it easy for developers to understand that. And the third, the most important, is bridging the gap between you know, SREs and developers and security and all these different factions. And so our product kind of touches on each of these pieces. So the first piece is like a service catalog. So being able to quickly understand all the services, libraries, components that exist in your ecosystem, what are they, and then all the metadata about them. So things like who owns a service? If I have a question about it, who do I talk to? Um, you know, where can I find the design documents and the run books and the dashboards for the service? Where can I find the Git repo? So just giving you like a basic catalog of all the services that exist in the organization. And this goes back to tribal knowledge because as, as, as Nikhil mentioned, like Conway's law, if your teams are based around the organizational structure, if that changes, now all of a sudden your services are, are left with like no owners and like that, that context is lost. So a catalog can help you account for that um, just by having this metadata in a single place. Now that you have all this data in the catalog, the next piece is like, how do we enforce best practices? How, how do we help you as an organization define standards? And so we have this product called Scorecards, which basically says, you know, using our custom language that we built called CQL, you can hook into your third parties and say, you can define your best practices. So every single service in our organization, before it goes into production, needs to meet these 10 criteria. So you need to have run books, you need to have dashboards, you need to have SLOs, you need to have owners, you need to have code coverage, you need to have CI, you need to have unit testing. How do you take all this and instead of making it a spreadsheet, actually automate it? And so that's what Cortex does, is you can make these best practices an actual like codified quantitative number that tells you, hey, this service is meeting 75% of these metrics. This team is only 50% of the way there. So we need to invest more time in this particular team. And so Cortex makes it easy to, to take this tribal knowledge and make it a very codified thing. And then finally, like actually helping SREs notify people and like push people, nudge people to make those changes for their service quality. Um, and then service creation, like actually automating the, the act of creating services and like, you know, best practices. Uh, maybe Nikhil, you want to quickly touch on that aspect as well. Yeah. Um, so this is something that we've been exploring very recently. Like, uh, like a lot of the times, like engineering organizations allow engineers to sort of build whatever. Um, but there is a notion of like, this is what a standard Node.js service should look like. This is what a Java should, should look like. It should have CI attached. Um, it should have run books. Um, so something that we've been investing in a lot recently is spinning up new services from Cortex. Um, so you can say like, this is uh, the template of a Node.js service. It has, you know, CI files, just Docker files uh, already attached. Um, so you can just easily one click, just create a new service and like put it into production that week. So don't think about it, trust Cortex, press a button, you have your service that has all the best practices built in. And I think organizations, regardless of Cortex or not, should be doing this. And you can use open source tooling like cookie cutter, uh, to do this as well. And, and that's what we're using under the hood. Um, if you create cookie cutter templates, it makes it easy for you to say like, hey, if you're trying to spin up a new service, don't do it yourself. Just click this button and it, everything is there set up for you and do it the right way. Uh, so I think that's super important when you're doing microservices right. And you also get the blessings of SRE and upper management. Like they'll support you and your service. Like it's not like I'm just kind of building something out in the wild and they're expected to support the service, but 
this is what we as a company define as a good Node.js service. And so there'll be a lot of support for that. You, you mentioned cookie cutter. Uh, I have a question regarding open source. How much open source do you folks do? How much you consume? How much you give back? We've definitely contributed a lot back to open source. I think we're using a bunch of things under the hood. Um, we use Antler for, for building our custom language. Um, so lots of open source operations like Spring Boot. Uh, cookie cutter is something that we, we started uh, using just now. And so whenever we use open source, I think our, our theory is don't try to build too much proprietary stuff on top of it because we don't want to lock customers in as well. So for example, our own service catalog is based on open API. And so we use open API, we've extended the official spec. And so it's a fully compliant file. So that way you're not, we're not locking you into some sort of proprietary spec that we've built and now you have to build your own parser. Um, we've given back a lot to open API stuff specifically. I think open API breaking change detection, open API linters, that's a lot of like foundational stuff that we've been working on and we've noticed a lot of gaps uh, in, in the open source. Uh, so that's kind of where we've been really focused on. Um, and so that's like our, our usage of open source uh, across the stack. I don't think we really use anything proprietary. Um, and so contributing to open source, I think is something that we really value. And we we like to make sure that we're giving time. If we build a feature, we want to build it right. We want to make sure we pull it back into the fork um, and then you know, ship it back to upstream. And I think that's really important for us. Ganesh, Nikhil, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about not only the company Cortex, but also uh, the whole uh, complexity of microservices. Uh, talk a bit about uh, tribal knowledge. And I would love to have you folks back on the show. Thank you for today. Thank you so much for having us. We had a wonderful time.